industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. What is it about the calm interior of a church or chapel that inspires in any heart a feeling of peace and solitude? What gives a church that certain atmosphere so appropriate to a house of worship? Some part of it, perhaps, can be attributed to the work of a group of men in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Craftsmen who, with good reason, look on their daily labors as a way of glorifying God. These expert woodcarvers render the beautiful woodwork to be found in many of the churches of the nation. And most of them are convinced they are, in fact, carving out their faith in oak and mahogany. Despite the sounds of mallet and chisel, this shop of the American Seating Company itself produces in visitors a mood similar to that induced by a visit to church during a quiet weekday morning or afternoon. The end of a pew is carved by a man whose experience dates back many decades. Most of the men in this department are in their later years, but to provide for the continuation of the work, they pass on their knowledge of woods and tools to younger men. Were each individual church, pew, altar, or pulpit to be carved individually, few churches indeed could be supplied with the splendid output of this plant. But the American Seating Company has combined the age-old skills of its craftsmen with the most modern industrial techniques. Thus, the master carving placed on this machine can serve as a pattern for the reproduction of eight copies at a time, just like the hand-wrought original. With the blanks in place, a guide is lowered to the surface of the master carving, and as it is moved along, it follows every indentation and projection. Its movements are duplicated by the machine drills suspended over the blanks. Only in this way, by mass production, can all of us enjoy what once was available only to the favored few. But American seating's output is not confined to wood products, not even just to church furnishings. It's estimated that 50 million Americans could take the load off their feet simultaneously by availing themselves of seating equipment produced in this 27-acre plant. In auditoriums, theaters, on buses and trains, and in schools, their aim is to see everybody sitting pretty. But their deepest pride continues to be the part they have played in creating scenes like this. As you watch Industry on Parade, you are witnessing free men and women working together as a team to produce more and better things in less time for more pay than anywhere else in the world. Unlike the slave labor of communism, American employees are asked their frank opinions about their jobs and the companies they work for. Some companies don't wait for formal complaints. For instance, one large electrical firm spent three months interviewing employees in each of its 126 plants for their criticisms, ideas, and opinions. This is just one of the many ways all of us benefit by working together in America. The Detroit plant of R.P. Shearer Corporation, headquarters of a booming industry built on what seems now like a simple idea that came to the founder of the firm only 18 years ago. It's the idea that nauseous doses of medicine could be made palatable by enclosing them in a digestible gelatin capsule. It was the forerunner of this machine that first started turning out the cod liver oil capsules that ended frantic efforts by parents to get their children to take their vitamins. 
two sheets of gelatin roll into the machine, a precisely measured quantity of the substance to be enclosed is forced between them, the dye seals the gelatin around it and out drops the capsule. But no longer does Shearer enclose only cod liver oil in its capsules. Now it's bubble bath powder, coloring for margarine, lubricating oil, smoke for toy train, suntan lotion, chicken fat for soup, just about anything that's conveniently served in just one dose or portion at a time. Tiny needles pluck the capsules off the rotating dies. The various Shearer plants now turn out several billion capsules each year, and there seems to be no end to the products that can be most conveniently dispensed by this method. But whether you're dealing with medicines or lemon oil for pies and puddings, there must be inspection to eliminate capsules that are improperly sealed or misformed. Some get special treatment to prepare them for distribution in tropical climates. All must be carefully measured. And while weighing is all right for some, when it comes to precious medicines, for example, the doses must be accurately counted. Again, a machine operation. So widely applicable is the idea, born back in the Depression days of 33, that now they package such diverse liquids as a cold weather starting fluid for engines, cigarette lighter fluids, golf ball centers, cosmetics. You might say anything that flows can be packaged by Shearer. Industry on Parade calls on a typical, picturesque New England town, Sanford, Maine, for a look at one of its leading industries, Goodall Sanford Incorporated. They're the makers of that familiar fabric for summer wear, Palm Beach. And though they've been in business 83 years, they remain one of the most progressive companies anywhere, possibly an explanation for their growth from the humble beginning of making horse blankets during the Civil War. For years, Palm Beach was made of Angora fleeced mohair and long staple cotton. But now, after long experimentation in its laboratories, Goodall Sanford has taken a big step forward by adding nylon and rayon fibers to make the fabric even cooler and to reduce wrinkling to a minimum. The raw wool and mohair are combed again and again on machines that remove short fibers and foreign matter not eliminated in the scouring. This also lines up the fibers parallel to each other. Next, the synthetic fibers are added and the resulting combination is drawn finer and finer until they are of a weight suitable for spinning a yarn of predetermined size. The fibers, called roving at this point, are spun through a series of metal rolls which not only draw them out, but also twist them, so that the fibers interlock and give strength to the yarn. In its plant covering more than 60 acres, the firm has some 65,000 spindles turning out yarn. The yarn is used not only in Palm Beach clothes, but in many other fabrics as well. For example, Goodall Sanford is one of the leading suppliers of upholstery fabrics for the automotive industry. Finally, the finished yarn is wound on the bobbins that will go into the looms. The wound bobbins are carried away by conveyor belt. On the looms, great spools of fiber supply the warp yarns, running the length of the fabric, while the filling, or crosswise fibers, are laid in by the bobbins. The warp yarns are alternately raised and lowered as the bobbin shuttles back and forth. From the loom, the fabric goes directly to dye vats, where photoelectric cells measure the degree of coloration, and according to the shade desired, speed up or slow down the process accordingly. Not all the fabrics are dyed in this way. With some, color is added to the unwoven yarns. Now the cloth is dried, and after every step in the operation, the fabric is subjected to careful inspection. 
A singeing eliminates stray fibers and leaves the surface of the cloth clean and smooth. Now the fabric will get a washing, not because it's dirty, but to eliminate shrinkage later. This finishing is accomplished on a machine that sends the cloth through each line at 50 yards a minute. Again, it must be dried and pressed. And the final step is the inspection that uncovers any minute imperfections, which are quickly corrected by these experts. From here, the rolls of Palm Beach will go to other plants, where they'll be fashioned into a variety of warm weather clothes. The skill of the fabric maker combined with that of the garment maker to create a product sought after by millions when the temperature begins to rise. Do you know that inflation has robbed every dollar we have of 45 cents in the last dozen years? Year by year, our dollars have lost their true value. Until today, the dollar is worth only 55 cents when we spend or save it. This is inflation, which all through history has come when nations like our own spend more money than they have and cheapen the currency with printing press dollars. Inflation can be stopped if we insist on strict economy and government, by preventing the private and public credit system from making inflationary loans, and by raising enough taxes to put our government on a pay-as-we-go basis. A roaring train pounds over the rails. What keeps those rails in place? Cross ties. And after several generations, they still haven't found any better material for cross ties than eight and a half foot wooden logs, seven inches thick and nine inches wide. Time was, many years ago, when cross ties were cut by hand, laboriously and wastefully. But as the railroads fanned out to all corners of the nation, the tie cutters found they could do the job far more economically and at the same time keep up with the railroad's almost limitless demand for ties only by use of mechanical saws. But here's an old timer named Cleve Hudson who works for the Kentucky Woodlands National Wildlife Preserve showing how he used to cut cross ties in the old days. Score notches all along the side, then even it up with the broad axe. One of the best cutters who ever picked up an axe, Cleve can still turn out a cross tie in 15 minutes. And he can remember back to 1915 when he got 14 cents a tie. So he agrees the modern way is a lot better for everybody. But like few men, he still remembers how his labors helped open up a great new nation before there were mechanical aids to make the job easier, faster, and more profitable for everyone. And Cleve still gets a kick out of showing how they used to do it. <laughs> 